Okay, today I'm near Leeds with Simon Walton, the owner of Proform Racing. Thanks for agreeing to talk to us today, Simon. That's okay. Now, I've, I've done a bit of research on you, and the first thing I, I noticed was that you left school with no qualifications. Now, did the school fail you, or, or were you a blatant non-trier? Um, well, I'd like to say it's a bit of both, but it's not really. Um, the, the, when I, the, year I was, the years I were at school was when all the strikes was on the teacher strikes, so there was a, a lot of disruption. But the, And there was also, the school that was at, there was a lot of work going on and there was a lot of temporary classrooms. So you had to move around and it was a good excuse not to go to the classes. But in the main, it was me just not going. We used to, um, it's probably when I first got into gambling because we used to play 10 P's against the wall and it turned into quids against the wall eventually. Um, and we also used to play cards on a lunchtime and I was quite good at, dealing from the bottom so i used to be the dealer my friend was uh put the put the money up and well, not a lot of money 10 p's and stuff and uh, we used to win enough to go to the amusements after so we'd sign in in the afternoon and go and just leave school walk out and um go to the amusements lose the money do the same again the next day so sometimes i stayed all day but most of the time didn't stay at school all day right so um, you saw the light when you left uh, yeah yeah so we, when it got to the exams and it, it wouldn't matter whether i revised or not I'd, there was no way i'd learned enough so I just i got i think ease in everything i think the only one i got anything in was um i did all my economics because my mum wanted me to be a chef and um and i still i'm quite reasonable at cooking now so which is good but that's the only thing that came out of it really so people of a certain age will remember the yts scheme yeah and that's what got you going can you tell us a bit about why you well, that was, my dad was always into computers and we had a ZX Spectrum at home. And um, when I went to see the um, careers officer at school and obviously I'd failed everything and he's like, so what, what are you going to do? Have you got any hobbies? And I said, oh, I can, I like computers. And we used to write, we used to get this little magazine every week where you could see programs in it and type them in, to, type the programs into the computer and it would create a little game or something. And... Um, he said, can you do some programming? And I was like, well, yeah, well, you know, I sort of said, yeah, I can do programming. Can you do machine code? And I didn't even heard of it. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. And, uh, and he says, oh, well, we'll try you at this place. And it was a YTS for um, half computers programming, half electronics. And I went on that and you suddenly got, you know, you got, I think it was 30 pound a week, wasn't it? Something like that you got. And my mum got a tenner and the other 20 went in the amusements. And um, I couldn't do it. Because I academically had sort of failed, it took ages, especially the math side of it. Uh, and but all of a sudden it clicked, and and the programming clicked, and the electronics didn't. I just used to burn my fingers on the electronics all the time, doing the soldering. But the programming, it was like um, I think I've got a really logical mind, and that's sort of what you need. So I managed to learn the maths, do the programming, and I just very rapidly. It was all of a sudden I sort of went from not being able to do it to being like right at the top of the people there and got a placement really quickly. And so it just sort of worked out for me and I failed the college because I failed the electronics bit of it, blew a computer at one time, um, didn't tell anybody. because we were at college and um, we were doing a traffic light circuit board thing. You had to program the program in, you had to program a circuit board to do LEDs in a traffic light sequence. And I could do the programming bit and then you had to solder the board and stuff and then plug it into the BBC Micro and then do it. And when I plugged it in, it popped the computer, popped the board, did set on fire, but it was like smouldering. But I was the first one who had gone in to do it. So I just unplugged it all and went back in and just never said a word. Uh, but so I failed the electronics. I got a referral on, on that because I failed the electronics side of it. But the placement went really well. So how did horse racing come into it? That's where it started. So I, I got a placement at a software company um, that creates that wrote, uh, like a development house um, that wrote programs for all sorts of things, accounting and all sorts of stuff. Um, and the first thing, the guy to learn a new, because it was a new language I had to learn, um, and he got me to uh, initially write a football league. So you type in all the football scores and it'd generate a league with the points and everything else. And I mean, I know that seems fairly simple, but from a programming point of view, to learn a new language, it takes you a little while to get around it. So I did that. And then the second thing he got me to do, because he was into betting, was to write something to predict horse racing winners. And he gave me a set of criteria of what you had to ask and then what the points got, depending on the answers. And then it just totaled it up. 
and then you do that for each horse in the race, get a total and a top one. So you're basically creating a rating based on somebody else's idea of what points should be allocated to certain attributes, course and distance winners, that sort of thing. Um, and we did that, I wrote that, we got it working. Um, we did it on four races, it spit four horses out. All of the office put 50p in or whatever and they all won. We were a Yankee won and we all won 20 odd quid each or something like that. It was, it went, so that was like, ooh, this is like quite good. So that's that's how I that's how I got into sort of being a bit quite interested in horse racing and programming something around horse racing. Um, but then there was a long gap then between anything else happening because it was more on the programming career. Um, I ended up at a, on a placement from there at a steel company um, that makes steel fabrications um, for warehouses and things like that and. Um, it just ended up that I was by myself there due to circumstances with the software house I was at and they employed me. Um, and then one of the directors there was into horse racing as well and I was still dabbling about trying to f refine this program and add more to it uh, in the spare in sort of spare time. And um, the director let me uh, sort of do that because he was interested in it. So it sort of progressed a little bit, but it was probably still 8, 10, 12 years down the line before I really... So when did you anything got, else when you got the uh, the four winners up when you first go didn't that didn't that make you think you found the golden goose and yeah absolutely with it yeah it did yeah so, well I was still betting then so then we'd go I'd go every Saturday with my mate to the bookies um, um, we were always in in awe of his dad his dad used to come in because uh, sometime in the middle of the afternoon he'd walk in with his big rock while a and it were called with his hat on he'd come in walk up to the papers just look at him look at the screens Next race off in five minutes, he'd write out £50 favourite, stick it on. And then some days it'd, but sounds like he's win, some, some days he'd win like three, four hundred quid. It might be like a five to one the field handicap and he's, he's got the favourite. But win or lose, he'd do it and walk out. And everybody, when he'd come in, it'd go quiet. Because 50 quid, it was like 30 years ago and it was someone coming in and putting 50 quid on and nobody, everybody else were putting 10 P's on and 20 P's and 50 P's. And, um, so we used to stay in all afternoon and bet us 10p's, 50p's, and we had some good wins. It was when Desert Orchid and things like and Panto Prince were running that sort of time. Um, so I would do, every Saturday, we'd, that's what we do, go in the bookies. So did you, when did you start taking it really seriously with you know, putting more science into it? Obviously, you had your computer program. Did you start reading form and you know, get inspired by anybody for that? Yeah, so it was around... Um, I'd moved on then to a different company, uh, and I was an IT manager at that point. So I was still doing programming. I was still programming horse racing stuff. And it progressed a little bit further. Um, and then the ins inspiration was Nick Mordin's book, which was uh, Mordin on Time. And it was the one where he's got all of his calculations and his standard times in the back. And he used to do it on card files. And it was like, and he even said in the book, it takes ages because he's got to go through them all and find the horses for the race and then mark them all back up and work it on that one. And it was like, I could just, you know, if I had the data, I could write a program to do that. So I just got the data. I, I basically, I sourced it from internet sites because the internet was starting to take off at that point, uh, especially from the racing side of it. So I, I got the data, sort of created a, a program to automatically create the speed figures based on his model using his standard times initially at the back of the book and then wrote a program around it that just sort of graphed them. So it just sort of graphed a horse's career in speed ratings and then put all of them against each other. So you can see all these lines in a graph and it just it just stood out you could see patterns standing out of when the form correlated with the speed figure and it had their perfect conditions um and i started betting on them a little bit and some in the office were betting on them but we weren't putting a lot on and i just started giving it away free on the internet on forums and stuff and it just sort of took off people there was like four or five hundred people it was just all free i was just doing it free in my spare time um i was doing some betting off the back of them myself i remember i did some really good winters back in on the all weather like course and distance winners next time up so that when they were coming out straight away just follow-up ones and they were sort of still undervalued at that point and it didn't work now it, it didn't work at all but the, i had one winter where it was just and i think i got a bit lucky because i was rolling up the percentages so i was i started with like say i don't know, 100 quid bank or something and they were doing like 20 quid bets and every time it went up i were up in the percentage of bet and i, I think i did like um three months of betting and turned the 100 quid into 10 grand or something um, and the, but the season after it didn't, it just it didn't work. Why, why do you think that, I mean, virtually every successful punter I speak to has got 
Nick Morden's book, or one of them. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think Nick Morden was so re revolutionary with the way, you know, there's been lots of books written about back in horses, but everybody seems to reference him as a as the changing point in the way they... I'm not sure, really. I mean, I, I, maybe it's something to do with um, the ratings, giving a... Reading form is, is, is such a difficult thing to try and get all of the angles and read the form, but if you can create something, create one figure, then and that, and that's where you know a lot of websites have ratings and stuff. Then it, it it's easier then to use them figures to quickly narrow a field or find a bet. And I'm not sure if whether that's why it was Nick Moore. I mean, I think it was possibly a lot of you know he's quite eccentric and the way they're written and stuff. And um, but for me, it was just it was more about the ratings and the the fact that you could I could see that I could do something that would take him hours in. Seconds. Yeah. So, so when did Proform as a business come into be, into being, and how did that? When, when did you decide to take the leap into trying to make money out of it as a business? Right. Well, so so I had four or five hundred people using it. Um. I just got divorced and met Deborah, who's my wife now, and um, she sort of pushed me down it. Uh, there was a, she worked at the same place, and there was. Um, there was making redundancies at that point, and I wasn't one of the people who was going to be made redundant. Um, but the contracts we had were so good that Deborah said, "Why don't you?" And basically, I was going to get a year's salary because um, I'd been there eight years, and it was a month for every year, and it was tax-free, and I'd basically get a year's salary. And I had all these customers, and we sort of worked out, you know, if I try and charge for it, possibly I could make money out of the subscriptions and make it into a business. And because Deborah was working full time, she just said, just go for it. So I volunteered for the redundancy and um, they accepted it. Um, they nearly unaccepted it because I was quite happy that I'd been made redundant. And obviously there was a lot of other people in the office that were not happy that had been made redundant. And I remember them getting me back in one day and saying, you need to sort of dumb this down a bit and look a bit unhappy because everybody else is really pissed off and you're really happy you're leaving. So I got, I think at the time, it was a lot of money. I got £28,000 um, tax-free as a redundancy package. Um, and I just set up and turned it into subscriptions rather than free. And it was really cheap. I think it was 20 quid a month or something. And um, I didn't have to break into the redundancy the first year. I managed to, because I did, you don't need earners, no. You don't, when you're not going into an office and having to get your lunch and get your travelling and everything else... Um, you, you only need to earn half as much. It's you, serious expenses eat a, you know, a lot into your salary. So um, it, the first year was great. We didn't really break into redundancy. It earned enough for us to carry on. And, uh, and then I just started evolving the software because I had programmed it. I just kept programming it and, uh, and just progressed it from there, really.